This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our weekly board chair check-in and update meeting. My name is Wilmarie Newton, and I will be moderating this call. I ask that you please mute yourself in order to avoid background noise while the presenters are speaking. However, you can unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question or you can type it into the chat box. If you're calling in from your cell phone, please take a moment to physically mute your cell phone as I'm unable to mute you from my computer unless I mute all participants and will not be able to unmute you after. Just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be archived on CAVE's website under services. Thank you, Patrice. Thanks so much, Will Marie. And good to uh, see so many of you this afternoon. Uh, as you know, I'm Patrice McCarthy, CAPE's Deputy Director and General Counsel. Uh, Bob Rader actually has a conflicting meeting, so we'll hopefully be joining us at some time uh, during our call. So I will uh, have a couple of opening uh, announcements, and then I'll facilitate the discussion because we really think it's important that you as board chairs have the opportunity to share with each other. Uh, coming out of the state level this week, I think probably the biggest uh, piece of information was the guidance on summer school, and you and your superintendents have all received that. Uh, logistical issues, next week the board chair check-in will move to Thursdays at 11 a.m. You will be getting an announcement of that. It was felt uh, that given as we approach the summer, that perhaps Friday afternoons were not the uh, most optimum time to have a scheduled weekly meeting. And as a result of uh, discussions at the this board chair check-in two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, um, <laughs> no, it was one week ago, uh, we will have scheduled for Tuesday a discussion with those board chairs and their superintendents if they wish to join us, where the district is pursuing a variety of committees to look at reopening procedures and protocols. So they, some of you had asked uh, that we facilitate that. So that's going to be next Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock. And again, you've all received the invitation to that meeting. So with that, I thank Sheila McKay for identifying some of the key topics that she's heard in your discussions over the past several weeks, and um, also uh, the willingness of our, some of our members of the board of directors to start off the conversation on these topics. So the first topic is graduation. And Don Harris, chair of the Bloomfield Board of Education, K president and member of the State Board of Education has agreed to kick off our discussion. Don? Thank you, Patrice. Uh, I figured I'd, let me get a, a better idea of what's going on in Bloomfield. So I had a conversation this morning with the um, high school principal and with the superintendent. And I thought I knew what was going on, and I pretty much did, I, except I got a few more details. Bloomfield's graduation will be held on June 15th as a scheduled date, except that uh, that will be the date that a video or film presentation will be uh, available to be seen uh, by everybody. What Bloomfield did was hire a company, company by the name of Vigo, v, capital V-E-G-O. And uh, Vigo is put together a, uh, putting together a film presentation that will include every member of the senior class, yearbook picture, a picture in cap and gown, a, um, a, a, a spread about who these students are, what they have done, uh, what awards they have received. Um, and that's going to be produced, uh, be available on the 15th. Prior to that, um, next week, um, students can come in and they will, will come in uh, under uh, certain times and dates, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of next week. 
uh, they're going to receive a quote unquote swag bag of uh, things uh, every graduate will receive. Uh, hello? Okay. They're going to receive a swag bag. They're going to receive their cap and gown so they can take it home and, you know, take their own family pictures uh, at their own leisure time. And, um, and then sometime after the 15th, a uh, time will be set aside for diploma pickup. And that's kind of a snapshot of what Bloomfield is doing. Um, what are you doing out there? Floor is open. Well, I can tell you Brantford is still in conversations with our East Shore Health District to make sure that we have public health um, endorsement. And we also decided to include public safety on the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. We're, I think uh, the watchword for what we're doing is we're gonna be exercising great caution. Uh, there were a lot, of con uh, a lot of ideas, but one of the things that stood out was we know, we being the administration of the high school in particular, that we can control our students to the extent that that needs to happen. It's the families that might cause problems um, because of their zeal for getting pictures and getting hugs and doing the things that families do. So we really haven't come to a final decision yet, but we're discussing it. And one of the keys is uh, student voice uh, is being a major part of the conversation. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, I, I've neglected to say that the um, the, the public health department, uh, which represents West Hartford and Bloomfield, uh, they have been kept up to speed. They have uh, approved our plans. Uh, the Bloomfield Police is aware of them, um, but again, we will not have this issue of uh, parents uh, wanting to scramble around, et cetera. So we kind of took that that piece out of the uh, equation. So um, because you can't always control your parents, I, I agree with you. Others. Uh, sure. Region 12, we're in the, we're still in tying down the last loose ends, but we're planning to do a drive-in graduation. Uh, we have contracted with a company, Big Wave Productions, out of Roxbury, one of our three towns. They're going to be putting up a screen that's about the half the size of one that you would have in a movie theater, drive-in movie theater, and they're going to do a production that we're going to pre-record at our studio. And then uh, we're going to have the, the graduates immediately after they have been formally graduated, their cars are going to line up, leave the site and parade through the three towns in our region. And the idea of that parade is at least in part to get them off the site before they get out of their cars. Uh, and since there'll be a lot of parents behind the wheel and they have a natural tendency to want to get in line and get their thing done, uh, that should probably help us because that was the biggest concern I had, which is you can plan it very carefully and then they'll just bail out of the cars, start hugging and that's the end of it. You've completely lost control. So. That's, our, that's going to be our effort. It's going to be a presentation. I, we're not going to hand out diplomas. Uh, there's, there's just no way to do that. Um, and uh, we're, we're, stay tuned because there'll be a few extra features added to this before it's over. But that's sort of where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Others? OK, Tuesday night, uh, the Montville Board approved uh, a graduation plan for us. What it is is we're going to use our tile middle school parking lot and, and put up a large screen uh, it's going to be, you know, FM simulcast, uh, each one of the, the normal speakers, the class president, valedictorian, and celebratorian will all come up. They'll each have their own individual microphone. They'll go up one at a time, do their speech. At the end of the formal ceremonies like that, when we, we're going to break them up into groups of about 45 cars each, and we're going to have three stations that they're going to do drive down to to pick up their diplomas. One's in front of our Tau Middle School. So what it is is they would drive up. The student will get out one at a time, go up. They'll have their diplomas on the you know long table ready to be done. Uh, they'll be uh, 
social distancing people there that will you know help advise them. Uh, there'll also be a videographer taking a picture of them picking up their diploma. Plus, we have a photographer there taking pictures. So there's three stations. One of them is going to be at the town middle school. One is in front of the athletic field that is behind the high school, and one of them is in front of the high school. And we're you know they'll be prearranged where which one of those three locations they're going to go to. Uh, that's you know since they're driving there, the student gets out. You know, we're going, and then they leave, and we'll have the police, the health department, have both bought off on this. The police will be there to help direct traffic, and they'll be able to use one of the three exits from our area. So they're going to be exiting from different spots too, uh, and that's what we've approved. And uh, we fear we can, you know, do it in a timely fashion. All three of those locations, the video, the video will be combined into one uh, video that will be given to all the uh, graduates. Okay. Then that's what we plan. Michelle, Michelle, you got a plan yet? Uh, Michelle from Newtown. <laughs> Michelle yep. from Newtown. Um, we also approved our plan on Tuesday evening. Um, it will be spread out over three days, splitting our mm. class up into three groups on a four hour schedule for each day. Um, the students will arrive at their designated time and the family will drop the student off uh, for the student to walk across the stage, pick up their diploma. The principal will read their name. This is all being videotaped and Similar to Bob's, it will all be spliced together. I imagine it's not going to be a 12 hour video in the end, but um, it'll all be spliced together for the students. And the, the speeches will be pre recorded and added on to the beginning of that video. Um, and then they're also doing on a separate day a parade of students in cars. They'll all meet at the high school in their cars, and then uh, the cars will drive around the town in one long line. We were trying to figure out if they would actually all fit into the parade route because it's, uh, you know, 400 plus students. I'm not sure they'll all fit, but we'll see. So that's that's the plan. Okay. Anybody got something uh, new and different? Because I'm hearing a lot of plans are starting to meld together uh, in different ways. Don, this is Sean. Um, the one thing we haven't heard, so we're a K to eight district. Uh -huh. um, and so we're having the transition for eighth grade. We will have our formal ceremony. We're, we are going to do it in, we have 44 students who are going from eight, uh, from, uh, eighth grade to high school. And yeah. so we're actually, uh, going to hold it such that, uh, each family is allowed to be in one car and we'll have 44 spots. They'll be separated by six feet. So if the family at the car wants to celebrate, they can get out and celebrate, but they can't walk together. The student will be called to walk to a mini podium that's being built by one of the parents. At that podium, they'll have uh, their certificate and a gift bag, and they'll have their photograph taken so they can take their mask off for the photograph. They'll be asked to put their mask back on. And uh, we're working with public health and public safety. So public safety will be there to control the crowd. Um, and then we're actually going to allow our teachers to line the roadway in with six foot distancing so that they can still applaud their students both before they, as they come in and when they're leaving. Okay. Uh, can I ask Michelle a question? Sure. Uh, you, when you have your, your graduates going across the stage to pick up a diploma, are they interacting with any person or they're just uh, your usual officiaries, officiary standing around and just uh, waving at them or something? Yeah, it'll be, so there are two administrators, the high school principal and the superintendent will be on the stage in designated spots. And then the students have a designated um, area where they walk to and then they can turn for a picture and then they walk and they get their, um, their graduation. I, I don't think we actually hand out the diploma at that time, but a booklet that looks like it has the diploma in it. And, yeah, the fake uh, diploma. We've we've seen that. We've done that before. Uh, the, the question I have though is: Is there any? They're not posing with either the principal or the superintendent. 
No, so there'll be designated spots that are distanced from each other. So no, they will not be interacting with anybody. We'll be clapping for them. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I, I, normally at our graduations, the chairman of the board hands out the diplomas and the, uh, or shakes the hands or something and the diploma's handed out by the principal or the superintendent. Uh, it, it's sort of a little kabuki dance, but the difficulty is, is we decided it wouldn't look right if all of us were shrink wrapped to do it, so. Right, so we won't have that many people up on stage and we will be um, distanced from each other and won't be handshaking or doing any physical interaction with anybody. Is anyone getting pushback, by the way, from parents on the on the on these these departures from the normal thing? Say that again, please. Are any of you getting political pushback from parents on the change in in plans for graduation? No. Hi, this is Liz from Waterbury. We're getting a lot of pushback from the students who are very upset. The parents, I think, more are more understanding, but uh, our superintendent has met with any students, you know, via virtual that w would like to discuss it. And, you know, she's really gone out of her way to really explain the health risks and so forth. Of course, you're, you're, we're talking about a thousand graduates in Waterbury. So there's no, there's no way we can do, um, you know, uh, a car graduation. So ours is all virtual and we're filming everybody. We hired a company uh, to do a lot of videos with the kids. So we're trying to make it as festive as possible, but no, no pushback from the parents really. Uh, it's just the kids who are upset, of course. Okay. Thank you. Somebody else would like to speak. Oh, Greg, this is Sean. Just to answer your question again from a K to eight district. Yes, we've gotten some pushback from parents. Um, that, of course, want to be up there taking photographs themselves and so forth. And we've, we've indicated what the process is going to be. And including the student, no more than five people will be out of the cars involved in that overall process. Thank It'll you, all have Sean. a great post-mortem after this. Uh, Thank you. Regret. Thank you, Sean. Somebody else like to speak? <laughs> Last night, we approved the graduation ceremony uh, at our board meeting, and we involved the um, students, the class officers, and some select students from the class, president and uh, valedictorian, etc., and came up with a plan that is very similar to the parking lot one. We are going to, first of all, instead of having those who normally speak, like the superintendent and myself and um, the uh, class advisor, et cetera, we will do videos prior to, and at three o'clock they'll be released for the families to watch before they come to the ceremony. And then we will have designated parking spots for each of the graduates, one car per family, unless there's an extenuating circumstance and then they have to ask for it. Um, we will have a stage and we'll have a table with just the folders. And what they're going to do is they will leave, the only one out of the car is the um, graduate and they will be sitting in the front seat, passenger seat and get out of the car, go to the stage, go back to the car after a photo is taken a professional photographer will be there and take a photo and then they will go back to the car and no one is allowed out of the cars. After the ceremony, they will go um, around town like some, several others are gonna be doing. And so that's what we're gonna do. Thank Could you, you say Pat. the town again, please, Pat? I'm sorry? What town is that again, please? Windsor Locks. Thank you. Don, this is Patrice. Yeah. I know last week the question was raised as to whether uh, anyone has creative ideas if you're using a drive-in graduation for any families that might not have access to a vehicle. Does anyone has anyone mm -hmm. been able to deal with that? When we checked, all of our graduates have the have access to a vehicle, so we checked that, and uh, it wasn't an issue. I always do as well in Windsor Locks. 
Great. So you've dealt with it by being proactive and making sure that that's not an obstacle. Right. Yeah, we, we did the same thing, Patrice. We checked ahead of time with parents too. And of course we know our students, so we would also know which ones might need assistance. I raised the issue in Old Saybrook and they're gonna check that out. And so that's good. That's a great question. Great question. Patrice, I know you have other- uh, Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now I, thank you very much, Don, uh, and all those who contributed. We also wanna have a discussion about summer school and Liz Brown from the Waterbury Board of Education and CABE's first vice president has agreed to kick that piece off. Liz? Okay, hi everybody. Um, yeah, I, I guess everybody has received the guidance from the state, which was very extensive and a little bit worrisome, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, has everybody gotten the guidance? Have you seen it? They're talking about a July 6th opening, and it's up to the district whether it's in person or whether it's, you know, um, uh, distance learning. Uh they're expecting us to post all of our plans on our websites for health and safety to make sure we're communicating to parents all the procedures that we're doing. Um, they haven't issued, they're, they're raising the issue of liability, although they have not uh, made a recommendation yet in terms of, you know, the whole idea that if kids come back to school and get sick, is, are, are we all going to be sued? Uh, they do mention that, but I don't think there's any specific. Patrice, there's nothing specific about that yet, right? It, no, I mean, I, what They're I raising think, the issue, yeah. When people ask, um, can you be sued? You can be sued if you do something. You can be sued if you don't do something. Um, you could always be sued. <laughs> right. there, there is indemnification as long as you're following uh, recommended protocols. Um, but that certainly doesn't mean that if someone got sick, they wouldn't allege that in that one instance, the protocol wasn't followed. So that I think that's, you know, it's kind of, I, we're hoping the parents are going to be appreciative that we're opening, but there's always that, you know, there's always that option for parents who, who if something terrible happens. Uh, you know, they're talking about, um, you know, compliance liaisons for the school districts which I imagine could be uh, anyone the superintendent appoints that would be the point person in every district, similar to what we do for the emergency management. I, I assume it's gonna be some kind of a health person in the district. Um, and then they talked about um, the priority populations. They're talking about uh, special needs children should be a priority, uh, English uh, language learners a priority, Students who have limited access to technology and may have been, you know, disconnected, uh, those are kind of the priorities uh, that they're looking out. Uh, they want to make sure there's a nurse available. And this is going to be a problem, the next one, for the urban districts. They want a parent to sign that they have received all these notices and all of these um, uh, that they're aware of all these recommendations and compliance. So in our district, that's um, no visitors on site, um, student meals will be to go or um, box lunch. Uh, again, one to 10 ratio per classroom, uh, six feet of social distancing. So again, it depends on your space in school and um, it's gonna be, I think it's, it's, it's gonna be very difficult. And then it's extensive, extensive, uh, recommendations for cleaning. I mean, I won't even go into it. You could read it. But one thing that might be interesting, they want a bus monitor on every bus. So I don't know if you see, think that's an issue. And they want everybody to be seated diagonally. So your bus is going to be pretty much half full. You can't sit parallel. You have to be all diagonal. There's a, there's a, uh, a diagram there. So I think it's pretty, you know, it's I, you know, it's pretty thorough and, you know, it, it is, it is, you know, thinking about the health and safety, but I think uh, districts have a lot to consider whether, um, you know, uh, distance learning might be better option with all of those uh, restrictions. It might not be feasible for some students or a very limited number of students. So I'll open it up for questions. We can discuss what, what you think. Let me, I'll, Chime in just quickly, uh, Liz. In Bloomfield, 
we kind of anticipated that things would still be up in the air as far as person to person or being in the school building. So uh, we elected uh, last month to go, we're going virtual classroom starting uh -huh. starting July 6th, mm -hmm. three weeks, uh, K to eight and nine to nine through 12. So uh, we're basically the same, uh, same classroom, we're gonna focus on uh, on language, math, and uh, and the arts. And, uh, you know, we're gonna, ha we'll still have the grab bag lunch program available for people to come in and get. And, uh, but that's gonna be their only contact. We're doing everything uh, via computer. Okay, yep. Don? Did, yes. did your collective bargaining agreements and budget already provide for compensation for staff for a three-week summer program? It's a separate. Uh, it's not a part of the uh, collective bargain. It's, it's it's what we've always done. So okay. uh, so it, as opposed to the teachers being in the classroom, they're now on the computer. So everything is as is as it was if that answers your question. Yes, it does, thanks. Okay. So lots to think about, and I, you know, in Waterbury, we have not made a specific decision. I think we are concerned about the special needs children, so uh, especially, so we're, we're trying to figure that out. Uh, we may just do one population and do the rest virtual or have a combination of something. We have not uh, decided that yet. So Liz, this is Sean. Um, with respect to the special needs students, as we know, some of them actually literally need hands-on. Yep. Um, and when I read through the guidelines, you know, I, I, I struggle with the notion of a para or a teacher fully gowned with mask helping a special needs child. I actually think that'll create more trauma than than assistance. Um, same yeah, we yeah. Talking, it's, it's, we haven't made our decision. Yet. We're still having the discussion of the same time, the virtual or in person, uh, or a combination of both. Uh, to be I mean, honest, and I, but one I of also the things think, that's come across that I haven't heard the discussion on. The, the other piece that's coming across is that's integrating into our discussion is with businesses reopening. I think the harsh reality is that for many parents, their child being in school, especially those that go to summer school, allow them to go to work. So mm -hmm. if we go 100% virtual, what's the impact of that family? And then what's our exposure? Right, exactly. Yep. Yep. Well, I know in Waterbury, our park and rec department is opening up uh, uh, for the summer. So that will give some relief to parents. Uh, they traditionally serve over a thousand students, and this year they're they're not doing it at the parks. They're going to be doing it at the big high schools so that they could spread out. And it's actually air conditioned, and they'll be doing a lot outdoors. So, I don't know if your town has a park and rec department that may be picking up some of the slack, but it's going to be hard. Yeah. So for us, they just made the decision last night not to hold a summer camp. Oh, okay. So Liz, this is Michelle. Um, just a comment on the transportation piece. I saw that there was a diagram in the materials. Yeah. <laughs> it was every other seat um, and only one child on the seat, unless they're in the same family. But that's right. less than half. That's like a that's less than. I think you're right. That's less than half. I mean, one one suggestion would be if they, I mean to put uh, some. You know, if they are going to be this draconian. Uh, to put plexiglass, you know, at the end, so that you could at least have somebody on the other side. I don't, I, you know, I don't know if that's a possibility, but I mean, the whole thing is is uh, going to be very difficult for our students. Um, I don't know. There might Plexiglas be another alternative so that we could use more space on the bus than they've presented. I think. So the plexiglass on buses like that, trying to separate the seating, you're you're really that's safety. That's a huge safety issue. If that bus has any type of accident, 
you've increased the odds of children being injured severely if you put plexiglass like that. Yep, yep. Having said that, Bob, I think the CDC guidelines that came out earlier in the week actually had that in the buses. Yeah, I, yeah, we're we're seeing different scenarios. Um, I, I just, yeah, I, I think that the cost of of this first scenario would be just prohibitive. I, I just don't under, I can't see how we would be able to do it. And yet, to your point, Sean, when I saw that, I said the person that was writing these protocols were medical and not safety oriented. I have a question. Can, if you can sure, hear me. Sure, go ahead. Yep. Yep. Oh. Um, this is Candace down in Westport. And we actually eliminated our bus monitors just this past budget cycle. We were one of the last maybe the last or one of the last towns in the state that still had bus monitors and we only had them on some of our buses but one of the reasons that we ultimately obviously for budgetary reasons but also very hard to fill those positions i'm guessing maybe that will change obviously with such a high rate of unemployment but i'm curious if anybody's got ideas about where they're finding these bus monitors well I, I don't have an answer for that, but one possibility is utilizing our crossing guards who are not working. Maybe some of them would be able to, uh, you know, fill that position or, uh, care, you know, some of the, some of the uh, ancillary staff in the schools. It's a good question. I, I don't know. Maybe they want you to be one. Maybe they want you. <laughs> Uh, this is Debbie from Wilton. Uh, we're grappling with um, summer school, looking at our ESY special education population. Have not come to a decision yet. That has to happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, our Parks and Rec program is opening up a, in a li on a limited basis for some summer programming. Um, but I think one question that we're looking at is if this is the guidance for summer programs, will this be the similar guidance that comes uh, in September, um, right. which is just mind boggling. Uh, exactly. So I think that has us, you know, we're all just kind of, I mean, obviously some to be expected, but overwhelming at the same time. So planning for that many personnel and that much, um, that many health procedures, uh, you know, could we, we we run the risk of sort of grinding to a halt? I hope that doesn't happen, and we'll have to do a lot of planning. But the time to take uh, time and staff that is taking, um, you know, just looking ahead for the relatively short amount of time that any summer is is uh, is overwhelming. So that's where we are: is uh, just trying to plan out these different scenarios and. Every time we just open up, you know, something as small as relatively small as getting the kids to the building, let alone what happens once they're in the building, uh, is just. Um, I guess we're feeling overwhelmed in Wilton. So, yep. no answers, just overwhelmed. <laughs> exactly. I do have a feeling that because of the so many things are being phased in to reopen restaurants and so forth. That and there's a two week incubation period for this virus. I think the virus is going to tell us what we can and can't do by the time we get to July and August. By that time, we will know whether or not it was a good idea. And uh, so these could all be just out the window, which right. means the uncertainty that somebody talked about at a previous meeting is not only going to cost money, but it's going to it's going to dictate what we can do next. And the uncertainty is a killer. I just want to, uh, before we close on this topic, as I know we have other topics, uh, the preschool experience of the daycare centers that are operating, um, they they do not require the children to wear masks. Um, in this scenario that we were presented for summer school, it says everybody has to wear a mask, which was which is is not going to happen. Kids are not going to keep a mask on. So I think that's another. Uh, another area where I think they're going to have to be more flexible. Uh, they're finding that the, so the uh, daycare centers that have been open with a lot of the health and safety precautions and the teacher wearing the mask and so forth, they have, they've had no problems so far. So I think maybe 
uh, as we as we go down the road, some of these pretty stringent guidelines, which are which sound great, they're just not feasible uh, in a classroom for kids to sit there with the masks. They're going to be pulling them off. I mean, it's going to be a nightmare. Liz. So <laughs> Liz. anyway, yep. You know, uh, just to um, most of you, I think, are aware. Uh, Michael Frieda, uh, the CCM president, and I um, co-wrote a letter uh, with Patrice's help, by the way. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. That has uh, kind of got some a lot of coverage around uh, the state. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about the um, working together with our town councils or board of finance, um, because I'm I'm not sure about your town, but I know the town of Bloomfield, uh, the town pool is going to be closed this summer, uh, and wow. you may be facing the uh, same issue in your towns as well. Um, they're not even going to open uh, yeah. because of the uncertainty. So. Uh, it's really probably urgent that uh, your your town council knows what you're doing, and uh, you may need to figure some things out together. So, just food for thought. May I ask? Could I ask one question? other? Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is Sean. May I ask a general question? One of the things I'm curious about is when I read what comes out of DECD, because I read both kind of worlds. They're going to be, they are going to be providing thermometer systems to small businesses for their reopening process. When I speak with my superintendent, he's scrambling to try and find thermometers. Um, seems to be a disconnect here. Is there anything from a CABE CAPS perspective that we could do with the uh, commissioner around getting support for the school districts to get thermometers? I know that Bob has joined the call, so he uh, has heard that, and I think we'll be able to bring that back to the education subcommittee advising, which continues to exist and continues to provide input on the reopening process. So thanks, Sean. And, and, and I if I could add, Patrice, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, mine was on a different topic, so if you want to add. I just want to say that uh, at our last meeting, uh, Patrice, I think Bob did say that he raised the issue with the commissioner about bulk pur purchasing a PPE, uh, uh, you know, uh, materials as, as a state instead of each district scrambling. So I think he has raised that issue already. Probably not specific to the, to the thermometers, but, uh, and the commissioner on his Wednesday afternoon call with municipal leaders and superintendents did indicate that they were pursuing the bulk purchasing, which they had not uh, been doing previously. So, so we I'm have to make sure this, it includes thermometers. Right. <laughs> I'm going to bring this part. So can I? Thank oh, Liz. All right. We have another question. Who has a question? Oh, I just had a, I just had a quick question. Uh, I'm wondering if any districts are considering opening over the summer, will that change what you're doing with your public meetings? Because it seems to me like we can't meet on Zoom if we're having our educators meet in real life. And has anybody thought about that? Good question. All right. Okay, I guess there... nobody else has thought about that. <laughs> nope. Good question. <laughs> All right. Good for a thought. <laughs> yeah, great question. <laughs> and I want to point out that that op-ed that John Harris referenced, uh, the idea for that came out of this board chair check-in a couple of weeks ago, and we were able to um, to make that happen. And now we're going to skip over the topic of cleaning. Leonard Lockhart, uh, unfortunately, had a death in his family and can't join us for the call today. but. Michelle Embry Koo, who's the chair of the Newtown Board of Education and CABE's uh, state relations chairman, is going to lead our discussion about planning various ways to go back in September. Michelle. So, um, we, as one of the representatives on these regional advisory teams, uh, we were presented with three models to give feedback to the State Department of Education. Um, and we, it, 
it turned out in at least in my regional advisory team and I think the others as well to be very difficult to come to a consensus on which model would be best. They all have pros and cons and they're very difficult as you know because you're discussing this daily thinking about it at night how you're going to do this. Um, but the three I'll just go over the three models and then some variations on the models that were were discussed. So one model was the alternate days model, which would be, as it was presented, was uh, one group of students coming in on Monday and Wednesday, another group of students coming in on Tuesday and Thursday, and then Friday being some kind of alternate day. Um, and I think the pros of that model were that it, it makes sense for a lot of the districts in terms of um, having some, some contact with students being able to keep the physical distancing in place. Um, and the idea that it probably doesn't increase uh, transportation costs too much, though as we're seeing, you know, as we talk about some of the specifics in the transportation, there may be other things that increase the transportation costs. And then some of the cons of that model were um, the coordination with parent work schedules uh, having parents have to do two days or three days a week is is going to be difficult. Um, the the idea of equity uh, being at risk here. There are some parents who can't work from home, and how are they going to manage this over the long term? Because th this, <laughs> as we go back to work, um, our business is going to be accommodating to those parents, and that's a really good question. Um, and then also the idea that there might need to be a second set of teachers in terms of um, teaching on those off days. Who's who's monitoring the online teaching while the, the teacher is in person in the classroom? Who's doing that online interaction? Um, so then the other model, one of the other models presented was the half day model in which half the students would come in in the morning and the other half would come in in the afternoon. Um, I think a lot of educators really like this model because it allows them to have daily contact with students um, and it provides consistency for them. The cons of that were, I think the biggest con is the transportation cost um, because you'd be running a midday bus run in addition to the regular bus runs. But also the fact that students will be on the buses a long time in some, like for a new town, we have a big area to cover in terms of our transportation. Students will be on the bus for a long time for maybe a three hour period in school. And then also the staffing issue, um, would we need to have more staff, again, to monitor those half day when kids are home, or if you're increasing the length of the day, and I think that's what the State Department of Ed was, was planning into this, was that the, the length of the day would be increased. So you would somehow have to figure out how staff, how you do that with staff. And again, this, it, this will be a child care issue for working parents, um, similar to the alternating days model. And then the third model we were presented with was an individualized learning model. Um, it's sort of an, ex it's really a dis an extension of the distance learning model, but you would have cohorts of students coming in for um, individualized education plans for any kind of um, additional assistance they might need. So you would be able to pick which students would come in on an as needed basis for personal instruction. Um, it's probably the safest model in terms of a public health perspective, uh, but we are currently seeing students who are disengaged with education right now, and I'm not sure this is the best way of um, keeping our students engaged. And then the social emotional issues that go with the isolation um, and also the equity issue that we're currently seeing. And then in all of these models, uh, <laughs> the idea of how you would deliver meals and the food that um, many of our students uh, depend on. How would you do that? And then there were some other models that came up in the discussions, one being um, 
similar to the alternating day schedule, except having a Monday, Tuesday group of students, an off day for Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday, have another group of students come in. That way you have a day of um, cleaning in between groups of students. There's also a European model or a cohort model in which certain grades of students come back one at a time. And as you are more, I guess, comfortable with the safety, um, you bring in more grades. Um, and then I, I think I'll leave it there for the describing the different models. We can all think of variations on, on these, but um, I wanted to just put, give you a couple of questions that have come up for me that I think are important for us to think about. First, I mean, obviously the one is what would work for your district, but also, um, what is the role of our schools in providing childcare? Because I see us getting dragged into this space between a rock and a hard place over childcare. And I think we need to have a clear idea of how much of a consideration childcare is for us. And obviously it, it feeds into this whole equity issue. But as the workforce returns, what happens with parents that have no flexibility to work from home or take time off? And are the schools responsible for providing, say, child care on the days that students aren't in school. Um, and then finally, what is the expectation for curriculum and learning? If schools are in for half time, but teachers are in the classroom from full time, how are the students getting that um, out of school experience? Are we hiring more staff members and how do we financially get that? So I will, open it up now if uh, anybody wants to chime in on any of those questions. Well, I'll say this. I, 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 think, I don't mean to be negative, but I believe it's a fool's errand. Uh, until you figure out how to get them on the buses safely to school, you don't have them at school. So it's silly to talk about which method you're going to use to reopen it if we haven't even figured out how you're going to put them all on a bus. I mean, shields, whatever. I, you know, Unless you completely rethink the whole transportation method, modality, you, I, I don't think you get them to school, therefore you don't get school open. Second problem you've got is until we, until you can safely put kids in school, I don't see how you can, I don't see what differences it makes you're bringing half of them in this day, half of them that day. That's only so you can sit them further apart. Uh, but you're not going to stop interactions. You, you, you're going to have the potential for a serious illness breakout until there's a vaccine. I, I really think we should, what we really should wait, spend our time doing, at least that's what I think we're going to do in my region, is focused on how can we improve the outcomes with long with distance learning? Because I frankly think until we have solved this problem to the point we're not, we may never go back to the way it was, but until we get closer to the way it was, we can put kids on a bus, we can put kids in a school, we don't have to shriek or worry if two of them happen to you know, whisper in each other's ear walking down a hall. Uh, until we get to that point, I think this is not gonna go anywhere good. I'm sorry. Um, can I, uh, this is Candace. I, I have some disagreement with that in that we have a decreasing community spread. Now, I don't know if that's going to last, but the state's going, it, I, I'd be interested to see what Michelle thinks. I mean, it seems like the state's going in the right direction. They're ramping up the testing. They're ramping up the tracing apparatus. I don't know if it's going to be good enough by September, but I'm hopeful it's going to be good enough at some point this fall that we can know what's going on in our community in terms of the virus and have school in a reasonably safe way. And until it's not safe, you know, do the school. So that's one thought. So, it, you know, I just think we don't know how it's going to go. And we have to be prepared either way. And then my second question is, we were, t we were looking potentially at a model uh, where kids go to school for four days and then they don't go to school for 10 days and we, and we rotate week by week. And this way, the thinking is, if somebody's going to get sick, it would happen in that 10 days. And so that might be an extra layer of safety. So group A goes Monday to Thursday and then doesn't come until, you know, the, a week from the following Monday. And group B comes Monday, you know, the next Monday to Thursday. I don't know if this is where we'll land, but that's what we were thinking. And, but, and then we were talking about how do we deliver what you were saying, Michelle, the, the real uh, in-person education and the remote education at the same time. And there was some conversation about like videoing class to the kids who are not in school that week. And I got a little pushback from 
the teachers about it in the sense of that they don't want to be like on display out in the world. And I wondered if you've encountered that issue in your districts. I mean, I don't think that's a good enough reason not to do it personally, but you know, I realize we have to negotiate it. So I'm curious if you've started having any of those conversations with your teachers unions and how that's going. So even more questions to consider. Um, I, I'll just say, this is Michelle. I'm. Um, we did talk about that public health model in which you have students in for a week and then a week off or something of that nature. I do think that speaks to the public health issue. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't know. So and then your your last <laughs> question about um, about whether there's any pushback on teachers streaming into the home, I think that's going to be, in our district, I think in all districts, it, it probably will be an issue. I think there has been pushback about streaming into homes, but, um, and the personal interaction online, but I think that's something we're going to have to really, it's something we're going to have to negotiate. I don't know, does anybody else have a thought on that? Well, I have to say in Waterbury, we just started two weeks ago, Google Meet. And uh, it was part of negotiations, and they're fine with it. We worked it out. A lot of teachers, we gave them computers because they didn't want to use their private ones. Uh, we accommodated uh, a lot of their things, but it, it's been no problem. Hi, this is Megan Sechen from Sprague. One of the things I think we have to think about is student privacy. And if teachers are teaching live and they're small groups and who's in the small groups and now families are seeing who are in small groups. So I think there's a lot behind some of the teachers concerns. Um, and we are going to have to think about how we keep students safe privacy wise in other children's homes. Michelle, this is Sean. We we started our our local reopen group uh, this past week, and we went through the three that you just covered. Um, and we right now we're leaning to stay away from the half day approach. And part of it is double transportation and the time kids are on the bus, as you spoke to. But the other is cleaning in between. Right. And you've got to allow sufficient time to get the classrooms clean before you bring the second group in in the afternoon. And I think to both this and, and Greg, I think, Greg, you're right. In today's world, with the information we have now and with the, the size of cohorts that we're allowed to put on buses, it's a real challenge. But come June 20th, when that group gets larger, and then we can see what the medical data shows in terms of cases. And then when we come to August, where it'll get larger again, uh, and July, I mean, it'll get larger again, we'll start having data that I think will be, to your point, Candace allow us to see which of these we might be able to manage more effectively with larger cohorts of students. Yeah, to your point, Candace, about the, you know, being able to um, change direction depending on the health status, uh, I do think that in the fall we are going to have to worry about the flu season and how that uh, how that complicates all of this, because I do think that there is going to be a lot that we're going to have to deal with. And I would not be surprised if we absolutely have to close schools at that point, maybe throughout the state, maybe in regions of the state. I don't know. But I do think that's something we're going to have to be prepared for. Can I ask a question about the uh, the ratio of kids in a class? Uh, the summer school guidance, I think it's what's uh, ten up to ten students in a in a room with a teacher. Um, most of our classes don't come in groups of twenty. So if you're talking about alternate days, um, I'm not sure you know how kids get divided in half if in fact even half is larger than ten. Uh, so you're either going to have to hire more staff, and that's assuming you have the classroom space available. Um, but um, it just seems that 10 number, I just wonder, is that, um, I mean, I'm not sure it's, is it mathematical in terms of how many six feet there are in a classroom, or is it a sound good number? Is there some flexibility? Uh, because 10 does not does not allow half of our students to attend at one time. 
I don't know. Does anybody know the answer? I don't know the answer to that. But yeah, it does make it challenging that <laughs> when you have 22 students normally in a classroom, how do you divide it, make it 10? I don't know. Again, the again, only I thing think, that I, I think the it's only... related to the fact that that's the point in time we're at. Come the fall, and again, we're expecting phase three, phase two, phase three, phase four from the state where larger congregates of people will be allowed to gather. I'm not sure that the 10 will still be there at that point in time. I, I think to add to the comment that when we have more day, as we go through this process, we will acquire more data that will better inform the decisions that you'll have to make um, and that the state will have to make when we get to opening school for the fall session. And, and that goes back to the uncertainty question. It is very hard to plan when we don't have all the information that we'll have in August. Michelle, with that, I wanna thank you very much uh, for leading us through this and any final comments? Yeah, can I just, um, before before we finish up, can I just mention that we have um, our own our own represent, representatives on the various uh, regional advisory teams and that if anybody wanted to give feedback to them to feed into this whole process, we have Liz Brown, Andy George, Chris Wilson, Joan Travella, myself and jo and Bob Mitchell, if anybody, if you have further comments That's on good. models, I think it would be helpful for us to hear about it. Yeah, and can I just say, it's Sheila McKay, I just wanted to add, we did send an email to each of the board chairs in those REST groups. So if you, if you wanna start a, a REST area conversation, just look for an email you would have received from Corey Yuchi, and you can start um, a REST conversation that, um, each of those REST representatives, uh, CAVE representatives, what have you, would be on those wraps. Terrific. Do you know if there, this is Eileen Baker, are there minutes for that, for their meetings? No, there are not. Oh, but there's, there's actually documents. I, I feel comfortable sending them out. If you want them, Eileen, I can send them to you. No, I'm just thinking because each area or each rat. <laughs> They have a different discussion, so it'd be interesting to know what Learn is talking about, and that would be Bob Mitchell. And so I would be interested to know yeah, what the Bob. Yeah, yeah. And, and Cabe is bringing together uh, each week the six school board members that serve on the regional advisory team, so that they're able to share and exchange information as well. And senior staff is sitting in as an observer um, on each of the rats. So I'd like to find out if we can learn about what the business community is prepared to do. Um, I agree with the comment that um, it feels like we're being backed into a really untenable position, which has nothing to do with education. It has everything to do with, oh my God, what do we do with the kids? Because we have to go to work. Mm -hmm. And I think there needs to be some understanding on the part of the business community that they have to yield or accommodate and I can't say that I've heard any of that yet, but it would be uh, very instructive to hear about that. Excellent Great. point, excellent point. We'll put that on the list uh, perhaps for a, a future discussion. Um, with that, we, respecting your time, it's three o'clock. And on behalf of the entire CAPE staff, we wish you a safe and healthy long weekend reminding you that the next board check-in will be next Thursday at 11 a.m. And please be in touch with any of us um, in any way we can support you between now and then. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Hey, Bob, can you hear me? Mitchell?